Okay, who is a research fellow at CNR, CNRS, that's the Centre National Francais de la Research Scientifique. And he's worked on uh, a lot of the philosophy of mathematics. Um, his thesis is on the idea of universal ma mathematics in the classical world, uh, age. A lot of his uh, research has to do with Leibniz and uh, uh, math, history and philosophy of mathematics. Uh, he's also the unit director of the laboratory here uh, since 2011, and he's also the co-director of the Institute of Humanities, uh, which is connected, which is affiliated to the university, as we were telling us earlier, which is trying to do something like what we are doing, looking at uh, unique uh, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary perspectives of teams. So they have a very uh, dynamic research center there, and he's a part of that a new initiative. And, in one and a half years, they hope to do something like what you're doing. I said, uh, we are trying to launch uh, an uh, institute of humanities in uh, Paris, which is very similar to the kind of thing you, you are doing here. And I hope that this is the beginning of some kind of uh, long-term collaboration uh, uh, with you and discussion with you. So uh, I will talk about uh, philosophy of mathematics, which is a technical and a boring uh, discipline. So I will try to make it non-technical and non-boring by uh, addressing some general stakes about uh, philosophy of mathematics. And uh, I will start, uh, so I will, I will talk about um, a research program that I have with uh, one of my colleagues about the notion of mathematical style. And I think this is something that uh, can interest some of you because it can cross interest of people working in literature, but also in anthropology. I will make reference to anthropology at the end uh, of the talk. So uh, first I'll start, uh, with some preliminary, pre preliminary remarks on philosophy of mathematics, because not, I, I assume that not all of you were familiar with uh, modern philosophy of mathematics. Uh, excuse me if, the, if you are all very familiar with these things. So uh, one thing which is very striking in uh, modern philosophy of mathematics, dating back from the 19th century, is the influence of positivism. And in fact, there are two kinds of influence of positivism, which are very different, and which gave birth to two different trends of philosophy of mathematics. One influence dates back to Auguste Comte. And, and the idea of Auguste Comte is, uh, was that, uh, in fact, if you want to do a true theory of knowledge, you have to not, against, against Comte, you, you should not do it a priori. But what you should do is to look at the history of the way in which people thought, really. And, and so uh, Auguste Comte's idea, does it work? Yeah. Uh, was that there was no difference between theory of knowledge and history of science. The true theory of knowledge is the history of knowledge and the history of scientific knowledge. On the other side, there is another kind of positivism, uh, which also wants to fight against Kant, and this uh, positivism was uh, truly, uh, deeply linked with log logicism. That is to say, this, this idea that we finally found some kind of a universal language which is given by modern logic and uh, predicate logic. And with this universal and transparent language, we can speak the language of concepts. You know, this was the Frege Frege's idea, a language of concept, a, a, a writing of concept. And this gave rise to another kind of positivism, which is often called logical positivism. And in this case, we are not interested in the history of science, we are interested in the reconstruction of science through logical means. These two uh, trends have in common the fact that they are positivist. That is to say that they think that now we are arrived at an age in which science detaches itself from metaphysics, from philosophy. So they have this in common. But they disagree strongly on other aspects. The first very uh, important aspect is the whole of history. The first trend thinks that history of science is the core of the true philosophy of science and the core of the true philosophy of mathematics in particular. Where are the other uh, trend uh, thought that this uh, history has no interest at all, and what we should do is logical reconstruction. All right. So the first trend gave birth to the majority of continental philosophy of mathematics, and especially the French philosophy of mathematics with people like Léon Branchevic, Jean Cavaillès, 
Albert Lottmann, and until the 60s. But it, was, it, it also gave uh, birth to uh, uh, important uh, current in Germany with people like Jacob Klein or Oscar Becker. So all of these authors were very, very interested into the history of mathematics. We have to look at the way in which mathematics develop through history to understand what is mathematical knowledge. The other trend was uh, what gave birth to the, the so-called analytical philosophy uh, trend and what's much more interested in logical reconstruction. There is another uh, difference, which is the kind of topic un un uh, under consideration. For the first trend, the topic under consideration is the mathematical practice. We look at the way that we do mathematics through history. For the other trend, the most important thing is the foundation of mathematics. And we have to look at the logical and secure the logical foundation. All right. So these two trends uh, had an evolution quite independent throughout the 20th century until the 60s. And there was a turning point in the 60s in which these two trends changed. And so I gave you a few names. The first very important name is Lakatoche. And Lakatoche, I will come back to that later, was the first inside of the uh, uh, post-logical uh, positivism uh, philosophy to emphasize, he was the first to emphasize the role of history because he wanted to claim that mathematical knowledge, uh, you can make mistake. It's, it's a kind of empirist uh, philosophy of knowledge. And so it works like trial and error. So that was the purpose of his book, very famous book, which is called Proofs and Refutation. But also on the French side, you had authors which are less well known, I think, uh, internationally, but are very interesting, like Villemin or Granger, who were still interested into uh, uh, the history of mathematics, but also into logical reconstruction. So at that time, you see some kind of a way in which these two trends could reconcile. But unfortunately, that did not work so well. <laughs> and for a long time, these two traditions continued to evolve uh, independently. Um, so one can ask if, if this, um, if this uh, program in the 60s was not a failure, because in a way it did not work. So we have to ask ourselves why. What is sure is that there was a renewal of this program in the year 2000, uh, which is the so-called movement of the philosophy of mathematical practice. So I will show you a few just to show you the kind of things that are happening now in the philosophy of mathematics. So one of the very important books in this uh, new uh, movement is this book. And this book was made by exclusively people coming from analytical philosophy. And still, it's all about history and practice of mathematics. So these, are, these people are very interested into the French, French tradition and the history of mathematics. Paolo Moncozu is one of them but people like Jamie Tappenden, Ken Munders, all of these people. Before, you had a book edited by Emily Grossols and Herbert, Herbert Breggers, which was in 2000, about the growth of mathematical knowledge with the same idea. We have to be attentive of the way in which the mathematical knowledge evolves through history. Right. Um, so uh, Emily Grossols is, uh, is a professor at Penn State University. And then you have these books about on, on mathematical practice, perspectives on mathematical practice, uh, new perspectives on mathematical practice. So you see, I can give you like uh, 20 books uh, in this current, which is a very uh, uh, a new current that I wanted to present. And this led to the creation uh, of the Association for the Philosophy of Mathematical Practice. And the motto of this uh, association is that we have, rec we have now to be able to give a philosophy of mathematics which is more attentive to the detail of the mathematical practice than to the history of mathematical practice. But still, it's very intriguing that we are, we are, uh, we are still giving programs in the 2000s. And in fact, this is still the same program that, that was given like 100 years ago. So we have to understand how is it that it's, it's still programmatic, that we, we can't do it. What are the, the, the difficulties? And my talk would be about these difficulties and, and some solutions that I try to propose to overcome them. So one of the famous motto that was uh, launched by Lakatoche was, it's a very famous quote, is, uh, it's a parody of Kant. The history of mathematics lacking the, guide, the guidance of philosophy has become blind. While the philosophy of mathematics turning its back on the most intriguing phenomena in the history of mathematics has become empty. 
So it's a parody of the famous phrase from Kant about the fact that concept without intuition is uh, empty and intuition between a concept is blind. So what I want to uh, emphasize is the fact that this motto, this program, involves many difficulties. And there is a, a good reason why it did not work so well. So I, I gave just a few, a few examples of these difficulties. So the first one is that, in fact, all of this movement was um, concerned with the logic of discovery. It was much in the, in the aftermath of Popper's philosophy of science. And when, what they wanted to emphasize is the role of discovery in science, and especially discovery in mathematics. But if you do that, you don't give an answer to the analytical philosopher because the analytical philosopher, since Reichenbach, they have a, 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 an, an objection to that and they say, you have logic of discovery on one side, but we are not interested in this. This is the accident of the psy human psychology. What we are interested in logic of justification. So of course the discovery in mathematics is very contingent, it's very complex, it's, very, it's, it's historically very complicated, but at the end of the day, what you have is theory, and these theories have logical forms. So there is a good reason why it did not work so well, it's because it was not an objection to the analytical reconstruction of philosophy, it was another path, it was an independent path. There is another reason why uh, uh, these uh, programs involved uh, uh, was not a, a great success, is that in fact, the kind of philosophy which is done by philosophers is not true history. Because philosophers, that was already said by Nietzsche, have a lot of trouble with contingency in thought. Yeah. And an historian has no problem with contingency, or is very happy with contingency. And in fact, when you look at this program, which tries to incorporate history of mathematics into philosophy of mathematics, what they are interested is some kind of a logic of the conceptual development. But the point is that according to historian, there is no logic of conceptual development. There is no universal logic of historical development. There are some some scheme at some point, but it's very difficult to find the universal logic uh, as Hegel wanted to do it for history. So this is the first reason. The second reason is that this program developed exactly at the moment in which social history developed in history of science and history of mathematics. And social history paid a lot of attention to external factors, whereas philosophers of science, they don't this kind of uh, philosopher of science, they did not pay attention to external factors. They were attentive to the internal structure of the theories, and especially for mathematics, in which people are very cautious with the idea that there is an external influence on the mathematical thought. All right. So in fact, this leads to some kind of a dilemma, which is the fact that on the one side, we have the contingency of the historical results, and then on the other side, what we want to find is some kind of a stability of, uh, of science. Right. So ph philosophers are interested to find some kind of stability of logic, and what they have when they look at history is contingency. And the big problem in this program is how can we reconcile these two things? All right. And then there is a third problem. And this problem is a general problem of philosophy of science, which is what kind of theory of knowledge can be adapted to a historical evolution of concept. And in fact, it's a very difficult problem. And that, this problem was raised by Hilary Putnam. And because if you want to be faithful to the idea of an historical development, what you have to take into account is something which is very strange. When you look at the evolution of scientific concept, what you find is that people are correcting errors. The history of science is the history of correction of errors. That means that at some point of history, you give a description of something, whatever, and another point of the history, you will give a description of the same thing incompatible with the first one. Okay? So an example which was given by Putnam is the example of the description of the atom. So Bohr and Rutherford gave a description of the atom, which is like planet orbiting around a little uh, nucleus. And then Schrodinger explained, not only Schrodinger, but all the people in quantum mechanics, explained that uh, this can't be real orbits. 
It has to be a prob probabilistic cloud. Okay? In, and these two models are incompatible on some aspect. In the first model, you can say, where is the electron? And you can say it's on an orbit. All right? In the second model, it has no meaning. So you have sentences which have meaning in one model and no meaning in the second model. And the problem raised by, by Eric Putman is a very interesting problem is, how can you say that the first one are talking about electrons if their model is not good according to the second one? All right. So Putnam said that we have to have a very flexible notion of concept. This is what he coined the, the principle of the benefit of the doubt, in which our concept can be, um, we, can, we can refer to something without having a good description of it. All right? So in fact, this is what we do in everyday life. All right? I can talk about some kind of tree, all right? but I would be completely unable to give you all the characteristics of this tree. And I can even confuse this tree with another one. But still, I know that this tree is not an oak, is not this kind of tree. And so I, I, I know not exactly what this tree is, but it's not this and that and that, you see? And so this is something that we do all the time. But this is very problematic because that means that we can have concept without having two description attached to them. It's very problematic, this, especially in science and in theory of knowledge. What does it mean to have a concept without a true description attached to it, okay? with a list of sufficient conditions to identify it? And uh, Hilary Putnam uh, proposed to have some kind of a causal theory of reference. That is to say, I can talk about this because I, I am in interaction with this object. I am in, in interaction with this object. And this interaction is stable. All right? So we have experiment, we can, we can have all kinds of experiments which are quite the same, but we evaluate, our conceptual model can evaluate inside of this causal interaction with this object. The problem is, you have no causal interaction in mathematics. All right? So it's a very beautiful model, but in mathematics, what will be the equivalent of that? This is a huge challenge, because I have no causal interaction with a circle. I have no causal interaction with a matrix or with a polynomial, you know? So how can I say that the concept of polynomial evaluate to history to incompatible models or the concept of a curve? I will give example later. But I have no theory of reference that allow me to say that. I have no, uh, no alternative theory of reference uh, than the one existing, all right? So this is a big problem. All right. Um, so uh, just to uh, continue on the general uh, setting of the, of, the, of the talk, these kind of problems are general problems of philosophy of science, general problem of philosophy of science. How to, how to reconcile history of science and philosophy of science, how to have a good theory of knowledge, how to reconcile social history of science and philosophy of science, and so forth and so on. And, and, and um, this was already raised by, um, these problems were already raised by Jan Hacking uh, for some times. And it is in this context that he proposed to use the, the notion of style, style of reasoning. So this is what I will talk now. So uh, here is the beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful uh, setting that uh, Hacking uh, um, sketched at the beginning of one of his paper. It is a philosophical task in all times to connect three things. First, social studies of knowledge of the sort pioneered by Bloor and Barnes in the Hindeborg School. So this is the trend of the social history of uh, knowledge. Second, metaphysics, particularly the debates that result from Hilary Putnam's series of revised positions. So this is the second thing that I mentioned. And third, the Brodelian aspect of science, that is the long-term, slow-moving, persistent, and accumulating aspects of the growth of knowledge. So Brodel is a French historian who put emphasis on the long term in the history of the Mediterranean Sea and the Mediterranean Circle. And he showed that it, Brodel's idea was that there was a huge, there was long-term structure and history that are linked to geography. It's very simple. And economic resource and, and, and things like that. So this is the philosophical of our times to connect these three things, in philosophy of science in general and in philosophy of mathematics in particular. So this is another way that he explained that. We have to connect newly, this is the same paper, 
newly, newly gained analysis of and case studies of the fleeting microsocial interactions of knower and discoverers, the microsocial relationship to larger communities and so on, so on, material conditions, all of that. Current philosophical conception of truth being logic, meaning, and knowledge. And third, models of relatively permanent growing self modulating revisible features of science. Okay. So this is very important. We don't want to lose the idea that science is based on stability and cumulative progress. So we want to have both things at the same time. The fact that we know, thanks to history, that it's very contingent, that we have a lot of accidents, that it's very relative to context. But on the other side, we don't want to deny that there is a progressive knowledge and a cumulative, uh, 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 some cumulative phenomena. So this is in this context that Hacking proposed to uh, use um, a concept or a tool that was proposed by an historian of science named Alistair Crombie. And this idea is the idea of a style of scientific reasoning. So this is a quote from Hacking. I start from the fact that there have been different styles of scientific reasoning. The wisest of the Greeks admired Euclidean thought. The best minds of 17th century held that the experimental method put knowledge on a new footing. At least part of every modern social science deploys some statistic. Such examples bring to mind different styles of reasoning with different domains. Each has surfaced and attained maturity in its own time, in its own way. An innate subjectivism may say that whether P is a reason for Q depends on... So then he discussed about the, about, um, the question of... Um, what he wants to show is that truth is dependent on the style of reasoning. So we will have a conception of meaning which works only inside of a, st uh, a style of reasoning. All right? So for example, the average man, what is the side of the, the average man is, is something that has no meaning outside of the stati st statistical style of reasoning. But as soon as we have the statistical st style of reasoning, this style spread everywhere in social science, and everybody starts to use this new kind of sentence, and they have truth value. You see? So this is something which is uh, very interesting, and oftentimes, Hacking will refer also to Michel Foucault uh, with this idea of episteme, that is to say that we have some framework, like this is uh, the idea of an historical a priori. All right. But Hacking's position is also very deceptive when it comes to mathematics. It's very interesting, but very deceptive when it comes to mathematics. Why? Because he takes back from Combi the idea that there is one style of mathematical thinking, which dates from the Greek. Which is the axiomatic style of reasoning. So this is not very satisfying for an historian of mathematics. For example, the kind of mathematics I work with uh, uh, I work on the 17th century mathematics. You have no axiomatic mathematics in, in 17th century. Oftentimes, I have American philosophers coming in my team, and they explain to me that mat the essence of mathematics is in demonstration. And I say, you know what? There is not one demonstration in Descartes' book, La Geometrie. Not one. So that's a problem, according to me, because Descartes' Geometry is a very important book in the history of mathematics. There is not one demonstration in the paper of Leibniz on differential calculus. Not one demonstration. It's all about algorithm. All right. So Hacking was obliged to uh, loosen up his uh, position, and then he allowed an algorithmic style of reasoning in mathematics, but still it's not very fine-grained. So we have only two big styles of reasoning. This is not very useful for the historian. All right? And especially because <coughs> even if you do axiomatic reasoning, it takes so many different um, shapes through history, that it's not very satisfying to say that there is one style of reasoning which is axiomatic reasoning. There is another problem which is linked to that, which is the fact that it does not really answer Putnam's challenge. Because Putnam's challenge in, is on a very small scale. Both Rutherford and Schrodinger, it's a very small scale of time. It's not centuries of history of science. And in fact, this correcting process happens all the time in the history. Uh, within 10 years, you can have a correction. So this kind of huge style of reasoning, so in Hacking you have six styles of reasoning. We saw uh, axiomatic postulate uh, uh, style, experimental si style, statistical style, you know, this kind of big style. It's not very uh, satisfying. So um, 
I will uh, uh, take another direction and another proposal, which was uh, made by a French mathematician. So I will use the, 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 the notion of style, but I want to use it in another way. I think that Hacking is right that this is the good direction, but I think that it did not, it did not go, um, it, it did not go uh, far enough in this direction. So I want to uh, follow another path, which was um, sketched by a French mathematician, a very, very famous French mathematician, Claude Chevalet. He was one of the founders of the Bourbaki group, for those of you who know the history of mathematics. He's one of the most important French algebraists in the 20th century. And he wrote a very small article, very naive, about the mathematical style. And he says something which is very simple, very simple. Everybody can understand that. He says, mathematical style, just like literary style, is subject to important fluctuation in passing from one historical age to another. So this is interesting. So now we have different styles in mathematics depending on the historical period. Without doubt, every author possesses an individual style, but one can also notice in each historical age a general tendency. So he makes a distinction. Be careful, because when we talk about style, there is two notions of style. Style, uh, your style, individual style, okay, point carré style, and style as a tendency, like Gothic style, yeah, or Buddhist style when we go in the cave of uh, El Oral, you know? So, uh, uh, as opposed to giant style in some other case. So, that you can recognize immediately, immediately, okay? But these are general tendencies. This style, under the influence of powerful mathematical personalities, is subject every everyone, everyone in a while to revolution that inflate writing and thus thought for the following periods. And what I find very interesting in this quote, this is the beginning of the paper, is that he puts a lot of emphasis on something which is oftentimes considered as being purely external in mathematics, the ways of writing mathematics. He says it inflects writings and does thought. And that will be the trick that will give me an answer to my di dilemma, di dilemma. Because in fact what he is saying is that first writing and then concept. Not first concept and then writing. All right? This is what he's saying. So then in the paper, he gives an uh, example, and basically he gives only two examples. The first one is the famous epsilon style that was invented by a Weierstrass. So if you had a calculus class in your, in your life, whenever, uh, you remember that you learned the definition of continuity with some kind of a mantra, which is, for every epsilon, there exists a delta, and tac, 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 tac. All right? So this... Uh, this uh, formula was invented by Weierstrass to capture the notion of continuity by using only finite quantities. All right? So we call that the epsilon delta style. It's a very powerful style and we still use it. Right? Very interesting. So that was invented by Weierstrass. This, this style opposed to another style which was the style of algebraic analysis in which you treat continuous function as if there were uh, algebraic quantities. You make computation with them. So typically Lagrange. You know, 18th century kind of earlier, you, you work with series, you know, you do computation. Okay. And this was opposed, opposed to another kind of style in differential calculus, which was Leibnizian style in which you work with infinitesimals. All right? So this is the first kind of uh, history that he is sketching. And another kind of history is the modern axiomatic style. The modern axiomatic style. And he gives a list of the examples. He says, measure theory. Probability theory with Kolmogorov, like uh, uh, algebra, algebra, modern algebra, you know, this uh, uh, modern axiomatic style. Right. So um, I will try to, uh, to follow this path and use this idea that we can analyze and, and that we can solve many of the riddles that I raised in the first part of my talk by using this notion of style as a way of writing. All right. And, 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 and that will be very interesting. And then I will try to sketch at the end of the tool what kind of theory of knowledge will be adapted to this kind of uh, approach to, uh, to uh, mathematics. But let me first give a few warnings. When I talk about ways of writing, I don't talk about writing. Writing is something, way of writing is something else. In a way of writing, you can have pictures, you can have disposition. All right, so the writing is this, but the way of writing is this. So this is a, a poem from Apollinaire. This is a page from uh, Victor Hugo. So you can have picture in a way of writing, okay? When, so I'm not talking about notation, 
I'm not talking about writing per se. I, I, I'm talking about something in which there is some writing. It's a setting in which there is some writing. So this is um, Stendhal, La Vie d'Henri Brulard, and he sketched some map of, of the place that he's describing on the page. So this is typically a way of writing. Okay, I need that because in mathematics you have a lot of pictures, you have a lot of diagrammatic elements and so on, okay? So another warning that I want to do is that st style as way of writing are clearly opposed uh, to another conception of style with this the idea that style is a shared epistemology. That is to say, a common system of belief which are shared by some kind of a school, you know? So I, I, I have here a quote of one historian which used the concept of style in this meaning. This is not what I want to do. This is not what I want to do. I don't want to talk of style in the sense of the British school of algebra of the 19th century. You know, this is not what I mean. I mean a way of writing which circulates across culture. It's very important for me, all right? And in fact, there are huge political questions behind this. The notion of style was used by, by many nationalist movements and typically the Nazi. And I think that when Chevalier is writing his paper, he's reacting to this. And he says, I'm talking about style as a way of writing. This is something that I pass to you, even if you are not in the same culture than me. So now let me give you uh, some examples so that you can see typically. So this is an example of epsilon style. And I did it on purpose. I didn't show you uh, one page of Weierstrass. I showed you one page of Poincaré. And if you know the history of mathematics, this is interesting because if there is somebody who is totally opposed to Weierstrass on the epistemology of mathematics, this is Poincaré. And still, when he has to do complex analysis, he has no problem to use the epsilon style. So the epsilon are here. If you have done calculus, you know this by heart. This is called the heart of cutting the epsilon. In, in this case, you cut epsilon in three, and then at the end you show. Okay, and you show that the function is continuous. All right, and here you need this because uniform continuity and uniform convergence are notions that you can't express without the style of the epsilon, in fact. All right, but what I want to show to you, and this is very important for me, is that ways of writing can be shared by people who don't share the same notion of what, is the good what are the good foundation for mathematics, what are the good concepts for mathematics. For example, what is the concept of a function for Weierstrass or for Poincaré, they totally disagree. But when it comes to use analysis to, to study some function, they can use the epsilon style, you see? And it's very important for me because I need a, a notion of style which can bypass the disagreement, the conceptual disagreement. I give you another example. This is a beautiful example. This is the example of matrices, matrix calculus, linear algebra. So once again, bad memories for those of you who have uh, had a, a math class uh, in uh, high school. And this is a beautiful article by uh, one of my friends, Frédéric Bresson Macher, who studied the development of matricial calculus. And so he took a modern handbook of matricial calculus and here, so this is a matrix, a matrix is just a table of number. And here you have a description of what is this. And the author of the handbook, he says, you can see this as being a vector, as being a table of numbers, uh, and so forth and so on. And he has put, he has put some uh, determinant, uh, a, a bilinear form, you know, and he has put colors. And he, here are the different people in history who had this concept, and all these concepts converge into this way of writing. You see? And he studied this history, and he showed that uh, what is interesting is that it is first a way of writing with very different concepts, and only after we unify this concept into something. But very late, 50 years later. 50 years later. So this is also something which is very important for me, that is to say that you can have divergent concepts which are unified in a way of writing, in a certain style. So matricial style is a typical style of modern mathematics. Typical. <coughs> okay, so now, I see time running. I will, I will go fast on this. So we, uh, I, um, I launched a program with one of my colleagues, Sebastian Maron, and we wanted to study the development of Cartesian geometry in the 17th century using this notion of style. So in the history of mathematics, 17th century is very important. 
It's very important because this was a time in which the face of mathematics changed completely. It changed completely by the use of algebraic tools for doing geometry, and it changed completely with the use of differential calculus. The problem is, the problem is, neither algebraic geometry nor differential calculus as conceptual innovation were invented in 17th century. Algebraic geometry can be dated back to the Arabic uh, mathematician with no problem in al Rayyam and so on. And differential calculus, we talk about that. You have many, many uh, traces in Arabic uh, science and in Indian science way before the 17th century. So how is it that we said that there is a revolution in 17th century? It is true that there is a revolution, but what kind of revolution? The revolution is in the way of writing, not in the concept. Because what this author invented is a new way to write mathematics, and this way of uh, writing mathematics was very powerful. So it's not only a conceptual change, it's a change in the material setting of doing mathematics. All right. So uh, uh, what we uh, launched is a program to, uh, to study this. because So at first, we are specialists of this period, and we were very intrigued by several phenomena that I will show to you. First phenomenon, when you look at Descartes' geometry, if you don't know Descartes' geometry, if you never open Descartes' geometry, I will tell you just a few things. The first thing that you see is that, contrary to what you learn in school, in Descartes' geometry, you have a lot of diagrams. A lot of diagrams. Okay? So we use diagrams. In fact, this is the second page of the geometry. You represent the operation with diagrams. This is the extraction of the square root. This is a multiplication. All right. So this is very intriguing because what we learn in school is that Cartesian geometry is about equation. Right? What you learn in school is Cartesian geometry is about, okay, first to, to draw some axes, then you write an equation somewhere, I don't know what, like, uh, like this one for a parabola, like e e e y e equals x squared, and that's the end. All right? So you have an equation, and what is on, 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 the, on the page is a representation of the curve. But here, no, it's a representation of the operation. The second thing that you find in Descartes' geometry, which is very intriguing, it's in the second book, is that you have a classification of all admissible curves in geometry, but this classification amounts to a very strong limitation of the realm of the geometry. What Descartes admits as being admi uh, um, good curves are only the curves that can be generated by regular motions, and this amounts to only what we call algebraic curves. And algebraic curves is a very small part of all the curves. Very small part of all the curves. So this is very strange. So first thing, you have diagrammatic elements. Second thing, it limits a lot the realm of geometry. And then another thing that you find, which is very powerful, is that there is an algorithm to find tangent to curves. I won't enter into the detail of this, but this is a very powerful algorithm. So this is the diagram that is supposed to explain to you what is a regular, regulated motion in Descartes. When, when he presents the curves, he says, when you want to understand what is a regulated motion, what he calls continuous motion, he says you take this kind of instrument, so you have, you have uh, rulers, and they push each other, and they draw some curves. But these curves will be regulated by proportion, by definition of this object. So these are root curves, and they are algebraic curves. So this is the kind of curves which are admissible. But this kind of curve is not admissible. The a spiral is not admissible. Why? Because to draw a spiral, you need a rotation and a translation, and you need to synchronize these two movements. They are not linked together. You need to decide when it starts, and you need to give the, the, the little pitch. All right? So this is the diagram for the method of tangent, but I will skip that because I see that uh, uh, we don't have a lot of time. Now, what is very interesting when you study the development of Cartesian geometry is that Descartes' uh, reader disagreed with Descartes on this aspect. Oftentimes, they get rid of this, of the calculus of segments. First thing, they, did, they were not interested in the way to represent operation by diagram. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Another thing that they did, so look at this. This is, Van Schrotten is the editor of Descartes. He is the editor of Descartes. He's a, a, a close a collaborator with Descartes. And he, he wrote some, a, commentary, a commentary on the geometry. In 1649, Descartes is not dead. Descartes will die the, the after. 
And what is the example that he gives? The cycloid, the tangent to the cycloid. So this problem was tackled by Descartes in some letters. And there is a good reason why it was tackled in some letters. It's not an algebraic curve. It's a mechanical curve. Okay. So for Descartes, this is good for correspondence and to show that he's very skillful. But this is not a good curve. And what does Van Schotten? He puts it in the commentary of La Geometrie. So this is very important because it shows to you that these people who are very close, they disagree on the delimitation of the theory of, of the good object. Descartes will never have put this object in, in La Geometrie. He was, he was explicit about the fact that this object was not a geometrical object, but a mechanical object, cycloid. Cycloid is obtained by making a, a wheel. You put a, a, on the wheel, and you, and you look at the curve when the, when the wheel turns on a. This kind of curve is called a cycloid. It's not an algebraic curve. This is the important part. Second thing which is very interesting, this is still Van Schrotten, but this time in, in the big edition of 59, of La Geometrie. Once again, La Geometrie, commentary of La Geometrie. So he comments about the method for normal of Descartes. And so he explains the method of normal. It's a very complicated method which uses a lot of algebra. And then he says, but you know what? There is another method, which is faster, which is better. This is Fermat's method. For, for historian of mathematics, this is very strange. Because Fermat and Descartes fought like madmen in 38, because Descartes explained to Fermat that his method was bullshit. And here, what is doing uh, Van Schrotten? Oh, I'm filmed. I should, uh, I should not say this kind of, uh, <laughs> of work. <laughs> I just uh, uh, and, and here, what is Van Schrotten doing? He put the two methods side by side. The method of the enemy side by side. I said, you can do one, you can do the other. If you look at other authors, for example, John Wallis, 55, this is the first treatise of what we call now analytical geometry. You have a, a reference to Descartes in the first page saying, I am doing modern geometry, Cartesian geometry. And then you look at the other page, and what do you see? You see these kind of objects. These are not Cartesian objects at all. These objects, in this kind of representation, the curve is generated by infinite, uh, an infinity of small lines. Can you see this? Maybe. Here, you see? All right. And Wallis knows that very well, and the authors who use this kind of, of methods were cavalier, infinitesimal method. So Wallis is writing a treatise of analytical geometry. He is claiming that he is following Descartes, and he just mix it. It's an hybridation. Do you say that? Hybrid? Hybrid? So he mix it with infinitesimal techniques. No problem at all. No problem at all. But conceptually, totally incompatible model. Descartes was f explicitly against infinitesimal methods. And he said that very, very often times. Okay, for philosophical reasons. Because we can't think with infinite and so forth and so on. All right? Um, and look at this. When he wants to give the method of tangent, he used Fermat's method. But he doesn't say so. So he referred to Descartes, he used Cavalieri's conception of curve, and he used Fermat's method. It is, he doesn't mention Fermat, never, never used this name. And it's no surprise, because we saw that Van Schrotten edited Descartes with Fermat's method mixed in it. So it's a mess. It's a conceptual mess. It's a conceptual mess. But still, when you work on this period, you open one of these books and you say, this is the new style of geometry, immediately as opposed to the old style, which is Euclidean style of geometry. You, you, you see that immediately. Just because you have diagrams, you have equations, you have a dialogue between diagram and equation, it's enough. It's enough to understand what's happening here. So this is exactly what I want to claim, that is to say that we can have a very powerful tool by using this idea that there is a, a, a style as a way of writing and getting rid of what we think is the most important thing, concept, theories, object. They disagreed on concept, they disagreed on theories, they disagreed on concept. This is shocking for a philosopher, but this is the price that we need to pay if we want to have a powerful philosophy of mathematics which is compatible with history. So, so now this is the kind of thing, no, so now I have to explain, but what is the way of writing? Way of writing, it's very, uh, very vague. I mean, uh, Chevalier said, so in fact, now I need to make more specific 
what I mean by that. And this is the, the general uh, schema that we have for the Cartesian style of writing. I won't explain it to you now, but I will explain to you the tool that we use to... Uh, but what you see, basically, is the following thing. So we work a lot with my friend to try to understand what, exa what exactly are the ingredients of the Cartesian style. What is circulated? What is common to these authors? And in all of these authors, you will have this. First of all, you have diagrams. Always, you have diagrams. In 17th century mathematics, you have diagrams. They will disappear one century late, uh, later, but in 17th century mathematics, and all the beginning of analytic geometry, you have diagrams. Descartes was explicit why you have diagrams. You have diagram, it's in a letter to the Princess Elizabeth, because you need to have some relation, and this relation has, has typically similitude and orthogonality. Because similitude gives you proportion, and orthogonality gives you Pythagoras theorem. Okay, so you need this. You have a certain, you have a certain geometrical, <coughs> you have a certain geometrical situation. Look at this one. So this is the method for tangent, okay, which is in fact the method for normal. You want to find the normal to the curve. Where are the axes? This is not what we learn in school as being Cartesian geometry. You have no axes outside. Okay, you have first the curve, first the curve. Then, what you do is that you draw a circle, okay, and the normal will be uh, the one in which the circle touched the, the, the curve, all right? So let's assume that you have the normal to the curve. Then, the axis you decide, it will be this and that, okay? And then you see that you have some orthogonality relation, okay, here also, uh, here also. And just thanks to that, you have Pythagorean theorem. And you write Pythagorean theorems. Okay, this is x, this is y, all right? You write, okay? This is s, this is v, okay, you write. Then you will do all kind of mixture, you, it's, it's some kind of a trick, and then you obtain an equation. Okay, this is the beginning of the work, okay? All the time, you need to do that. So you need a diagram. I insist on that, you need a diagram. This is not Euler, okay? A diagram, what is a diagram? Why, why do I say diagram and not figure or something like that? A diagram is a drawing on which you see, you can, you can draw some inference with the, with the drawing. The drawing by itself, it's just a drawing, you know? But then I draw some inferences, like proportion, like orthogonality. So this is a diagram. A diagram is a way in which I mixed, I look at something which is material, okay? And I draw some inferences, and this is the diagram, okay? And the on the other side, this diagram is coupled with algebraic writing, right? So here you have writing, writing, which is material. Writing is material. It's a material thing. You write the equation. And you can draw some inferences. These are very difficult to explain. I won't explain to you the kind of, uh, of inferences that are here. But this method, these two methods, are what is really new in 17th mathematics. As, as compared to algebraic mathematics, to uh, all kinds of mathematics that you can find before. We, we, we choose algebra. Okay, so where did we get this, uh, this kind of uh, representation from? So this is the last part of my talk. Yeah, so I will uh, try to go fast. Uh, but uh, not too fast because this is the most interesting part for the, as, as we get the trans transdisciplinary uh, aspect. So we took this kind of diagram from a study which was uh, made by an anthropologist, a cognitive anthropologist, as he called himself, Edwin Hutchins. Maybe some of you know him. He's the one who invented the notion of distributed knowledge. Uh, I don't know if you know this. Well, anyway, we can talk about this. And he was interested in, um, when he was young, he did, he did one, of his, one, of the, one of his fields in ethnology by studying the kind of astronomical models that are used by people in the Trobian Island. Right? And these models are very strange because it, it's, it's a narrative. It's a story. So you see some uh, islands in the sky and you tell a narrative about this island. And what is very disturbing is that it's not a representation of the sky. It's not as if this island corresponds to this star and this configuration of star. It's not like this. It's a dynamic scheme which evolves all the time and it's part of a whole narrative, a mythological narrative. And still it works. And so Hachin was intrigued by that because it's a very complex system and, and how is it that works. 
And it he, he, he started to collect all kind of, ex of the same kind of example in which we use some material uh, objects around us to think with. And these material objects don't represent something. They don't represent, they carry some inferences. It's the dynamical aspect. So he, he, he has a lot of examples. Let me give you two. For example, this Japanese hand calendar. So in Japanese culture, there is an exam which is uh, uh, mandatory for a civil servant, which is the fact that I give you a date, and you have a date like uh, November 1st, uh, 1962, and you have to tell me what day of the week it was. Very, very interesting exam. And so it's very complicated, mathematically speaking, because as you know, you have to calculate uh, modulo, how do you say modulo? I don't know. Uh, you have to, it's modulo 7, modulo 12, plus the, 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 the bad, uh, you know, the 4. I don't know you said that in English. So in fact, it's quite impossible to do this kind of calculus by, by, by head. But in fact, it's very easy if you use your hands. So they map on their hands, um, some, they have some map, in which you have the months of the, of the year and the day of the week, okay? They map this, you need to memorize five maps, you map them on your hands, and then you do the calculation with your fingers like that, and you produce the date like, it's like a computer, okay? It's like a computer, it does it for you. It's not a representation. It does not represent the day of the week and the, and, and the, uh, and the month of the year. It's a tool, you know. And it's very interesting because it, it, it brings, the question is, what happens when kids use their fingers to count? So the modern view on that, following Cantor, is that they map, they do a, a bijective, bijective mapping between their fingers and something else, okay? And this is the core. But this is not true. This is not true. Because you can do all kind of bijective mapping. For example, you that do, can do bijective mapping with stains on a sheet of paper. But with stains, you can't count. With fingers, you can, because you can add them, subtract them, you can move them, all right? So they are not only doing bijective mapping. They are not representing numbers. They are counting with their fingers. And what is interesting is that they don't need a concept of number. You don't need a concept of year, of months, of calculus modulo, whatever. You just need to learn how it works. Just you map something. The other example, which is very interesting, is the classical method of, um, the method of uh, Ars Memoriae, um, uh, uh, which is the idea that to remember a story, this is linked to old ancient classical rhetoric, to remember a story, you will imagine a landscape, you will map some ideas to this landscape, and you will imagine yourself going to this, to this palace and to this landscape. And this is interesting because, to, because you have a double mapping in this case. In this, in this you have just one mapping, but in this case, you have two mapping because you have first to imagine the, a trajectory into a landscape. This is some kind of imagination. And then you have to map some ideas. Okay, these are two, two, two things. You need order, a certain order, and ideas. Okay, you need both things. It's very interesting. And of course, we are interested in this kind of model because you saw that with the Cartesian style, we have this kind of double mapping. Okay. What is very interesting, uh, what is very important for Unchained is to emphasize the fact that this is not representation. This is not representation, is the way to map, so what he calls a conceptual space is mapped into a material setting and this gives what he calls a blend, a blend. So a blend is a mixture of inferences and material objects and the material objects support the blend. And he, and he emphasized that this is not like this. This is not as if you selected the information to representation. This is not like this. You mark directly on the object, on the material setting. All right. And um, um, yes. And what is interesting is that he emphasized the fact that that I can give you the blend, and you can work with it and make it evaluate. I can give you this, and you can complete it. You can change it. You can play with it. You can map other things on it. You know? So this is really like giving you a material object with a, a, tool, um, a tool kit. Uh, uh, and then you can play with it by using other tools. All right? OK, so this is the framework that we want to use. And you see what we, what we did. So, so that means that what we want to emphasize is that what is interesting in ways of writing is that there are material settings. 
And this material settings will carry some inferences. All right. So I had other examples, but I will uh, stop here as regard the examples because I'm too, too long. But an example that I love, so I can't resist to quote it, is this one from my favorite author, which is Leibniz. So let's read this quote, this only quote from Leibniz. When our friends were disputing in France with the Abbe Galois, Father Gouy, and others, so this is a reference to the fact that uh, Leibniz arrived in France and he will visit his friends who are fighting for the infinitesimal calculus at the Academy des Sciences. All right? So when our friends were disputing in France, I told them that I did not believe at all that there were actual infinite or actual infinitesimal quantities. The latter, like the imaginary roots of algebra, were only fictions, which however could be used for the sake of brevity or in order to speak universally. But as the Marquis de l'Hôpital thought that by this I should betray the cause, they asked me to say nothing about it, except what I already had said in the last acta. So what happened? The people were defending Leibniz's calculus in the Académie des Sciences. And one day Leibniz visited them. And they were all saying that there are infinitesimals. There are really infinitesimal quantities. And so the Marquis de l'Hôpital says to Leibniz, please, can you take, can you support us? And Leibniz says, I'm sorry, there is no infinitesimal quantities. And what do they say? They shut up Leibniz, you will ruin the cause. <laughs> so what does that mean? This is very interesting. They are friends. They are good friends. They are working in the same school. But they disagree strongly on the foundations, on the most important thing according to the foundationalists. One thing that there is infinitesimal quantities, the other thing they are not. And what it shows is that you don't need to believe in infinitesimal quantity to do differential calculus. This was the case of Leibniz, contrary to what is often said. All right. So I have another example which is very interesting, but I, I, I won't go into it, which is the, the classical Euclidean geometry analyzed by Manders, because Ken Manders did a very beautiful analysis in the, in the book that I mentioned before, The Philosophy of Mathematical Practice. There is this paper, and if you're interested in Euclidean practice, you should read it, because he, he made an analysis which is exactly like the one that we are doing with Cartesian geometry by showing that, in fact, in Euclidean geometry, the picture can't be a representation. And in fact, if you think of it, it's obvious. Why? Because in, in, in Euclidean geometry, you have a lot of reductio ad absurdum. That means that to demonstrate something, you first say the contrary, and you show that it leads to an absurdity. So let me give you just one example, which is here. So I want to show that two circles intersect only in two points. Do you agree? So I say, no, this is, let's suppose it's not, it's not the case. And let's suppose I have two. So look at the picture. It's impossible to draw the picture with two circles. By definition, <laughs> this is precisely what I want to show. So what do I do? I do something which looks like an ellipse or something like that. And nobody raises his hands on it by saying, this is not a circle. We don't care. In Euclidean geometry, we don't care. This can be a circle if I decide to make this. And why? <coughs> because this object, this diagram, this material object is important as, as long as it, as it carries some inferences and not as a representation. Not as a representation. I can give you zillions of examples. In book 3 of UK, 75% of the demonstration I, 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 I saw. 75. In book 5 of Apollonius, 100% of the demonstration I, 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 I saw. So all the diagrams are false. So if you think that a diagram is a representation, you will have trouble by, by looking at it. Not a problem. Okay? Um, you have a, a proposition, a very famous proposition, you want to show that two uh, lines uh, which are parallel do not meet, okay? So let's suppose that they meet. So here I have a, 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 a triangle. Oh yes, is it a triangle? Is it a triangle? Is it a good representation of triangle? If it is, you will have, you will have a lot of trouble in other propositions. So, but we don't care. In this proposition, we don't. Okay, conclusion. What time is it? Five. Uh, okay, so uh, what I wanted to show uh, to you is that first, this is what I have uh, done in the, in the first part, uh, there is a new challenge for the philosophy of math. There is a new challenge for the philosophy of math, which is part of a bigger challenge with the, for philosophy of science, which is how can we reconcile with the fact that science has an history, a true history. A true history which means incompatible concept, disagreement, 
contingency accidents, all of them. So this is a big challenge today for philosophy of science. At first, I wanted to entitle this talk, Does Mathematics Have a History? Because in a way, everybody knows that mathematics has an history, but it's not acceptable from a philosophical point of view. And many people, they still are obliged to say that uh, all the propositions in Euclid are truths that we accept and are demonstrated once and for all, you know, and that it's a cumulative concept like that. But that means that they did not read book five of Euclid because uh, I can tell you that uh, sure they are truths, but not truths that you may understand. Not truths that you may understand. They are so strange. So uh, what I want to show to you is that there is this big challenge. And, and the kind of tool that we are trying to uh, develop are uh, linked to this idea of style, that is, to do, that is to say that you have a relative truth to a style. Style is relative, the truth is relative to a style. Objects are relative to a style. But more than that, what we want to show is that with strange or original institution. First, we have the, the attention paid to inferences more than on object and terms. Very important. Second thing is that we emphasize the material aspects of mathematics. Material aspects. Uh, for example, in my discussion with people in my team working on Chinese mathematics, Indian mathematics, they are very interested by that because you, the use of the proxies that, uh, that, that are uh, used for calculation is very important. Very important in all the culture. And we tend to forget about that. We tend to forget about that in modern, so called modern mathematics. Because we don't see, this is the other point, that symbols are material proxies. Symbols are material proxies for inferences. They are not representation. X and Y, they have representative, representative uh, function. But they are more than that. They are, they are uh, diagrams in the Persian sense of, uh, of what they are. They, they carry some relations. And the other thing which is very interesting and I think very uh, Stimulating is the fact that it seems that there is a continuity in this model between everyday reason when we use this object to reason and mathematics. So we, we, we start to see mathematics as, as living in a real abstract realm of concepts. We, we start to see it this way. We see it as a practice which is in the continuity with every everyday uh, kind of reason. So I will just read this to you and then I promise it's finished. This is a quote by Hutchins in his book, uh, in his article. This article you can have it online, uh, by, by the way. You just type uh, you, uh, in Google, it's Hutchins, uh, Material Anchors, and you arrive directly on, on, on this article. Unfortunately, this is the only article that Hutchins wrote on this issue. In some cases, it is possible to do the cognitive work by imagining the manipulation of physical structure. Sometimes you need the physical structure, sometimes you can imagine it. Okay. So this is interesting for the role of imagination in mathematics. In others, the case of the cycle, for example, it is necessary to manipulate the physical device itself because it is not possible to imagine it accurately enough to be of use. The cultural process of crystal crystallizing conceptual models in material structure and sending those up through time puts modern humans in a world where thinking depends in significant measure on the variability of a set of physical structure that can be manipulated in this way. Just think of, the, of your computer and, then, and all of the things that you use to think, use to think all the time. A final term on this path, so this is the continuity that I was talking about. A final term on this path is that when the material structure becomes very familiar, it may be possible to imagine the material structure when it is not present in the environment. It is even possible to imagine systematic transformation applied to such a presentation. Like again, you know, I give you the blend and we play with it. And we find that in every, every country. This happened historically with the development of mathematical and logical symbol systems in our own cultural tradition. So instead of seeing this so-called Western tradition as being different, we just see it as a pure continuity of this material aspect that is everywhere in every culture. Uh, the only thing is that we use another kind of machine, which is symbols. That's all. But this is a machine. This is a machine. This is a material thing. Beginning as external representation, physically embodied and operated upon these manual schemes, we learn to imagine them and to operate on the imagined structures. Unfortunately, 
much of cognitive science is based on the mistaken view that this relatively recent cultural invention is the architecture of cognition. So we confuse the tool that we use with the way that we think with them. The very idea of rationality as held by game theorists, economists, and political scientists is a cultural construct that owes its existence to the ability to create a certain class of immaterial unproposed problems. It is a mistake to assume that thinking is in general a simple manipulation process. Thank you for your Examples which I'm sure you're aware of, but you know, which I've discussed in greater detail. For example, the writing of uh, tensor notation, which revolutionizes uh, you know, relativity, but it is a writing strategy which actually gets you cognitive capacity to do uh, something with mathematics. And the other example, which is to me very fascinating, is the you know the generalization of the exponential function to Lie algebra to uh, you know the e to the power of a matrix form and so on. So. We are very sympathetic to it, um, you know, uh, not just personally, but I think a larger group of people who want to look at mathematics, you know, via Rotman and uh, work on that embodied ideas. But I also find there's a very interesting connection to certain aspects of Indian mathematics. I'm just expanding what you're saying into a, a different, uh, you know, a kind of reading of Indian mathematics, which might interest you in this context. You know. uh, one, of course, the question the, the meaning of the word style and the way in which you use the word style. Um, as you might be aware, I think one of the most powerful uses of this term was actually by Heisenberg. I mean in the science literature at least, right? When he but the when he said that there are different styles, classical physics and thermodynamics. And but I think what he meant by style was uh, he, there is some overlap with what you what you mean by style, but there was also some differences. So uh, on the one hand, the problem is perhaps because style is an aesthetic element of yeah. writing or something, you know. And uh, as you know, both mathematics and science resist the aesthetic element in epistemological claims. I mean, they don't have a role. And I think Heisenberg's uh, really brave claim there was that aesthetics leads to epistemology, which is really my interest in seeing these mathematical terms. Yeah. In the context of Indian mathematics, the thing which might interest you is this, that um, you know, this whole question about concepts, as you so nicely uh, said, you know, the distinction between concepts and the kinds of things that you do, materiality of them, and the way we work with them, is best exemplified in this debate, uh, I mean, the not the debate, in this conceptualization of the square root, the square root of two, the irrational numbers, right? So we have all been told in the Greek tradition, the Pythagoras reaction to root two and etc., right? In the Indian tradition, how square root of 2 comes is very interesting. It actually arises uh, in very early Indian texts of construction, manual construction of these ways of doing sacrifices. So when they, uh, the way they encounter square root of 2 is not as a conceptual problem and not as a problem which is irrational, in a very profound sense of the word irrational, right, with all its negative connotations, but rather as a simple question, it's posed as a question. Mm -hmm. You have a, a Vedic pyre where you do the sacrifices and it is a square. And the question is, if you want to double the area of this pyre, what should the length be? And rather than get into the questions of what is the meaning of square root of 2, what they do is they give you the number. They give you the value. They say, well, if you want to build this Vedic pyre of square, double the size, increase the length by 1.4. So they actually give an approximation. 
this whole engagement with this conceptual world, and that's a very, you know, a very platonic influence, which is a terrible influence according to me, you know, on what, what has happened with uh, philosophy of mathematics, inability to engage with questions of writing. Uh, you know, in the Indian context, it never arises mm -hmm. to the extent, I mean, it has very negative yeah. consequences also, yeah. that they're not able to do certain things which happens with, uh, you know, Western mathematics. But when it comes to these things, they are, it's about the materiality, not just of writing, but materiality of production, yeah. mm -hmm. doing things with mathematical terms. Mm -hmm. So when you look at Indian, uh, for example, the, the one I was telling you about the calculus, right? It's a very fascinating debate. People have been fighting about it across the seas. Uh, you know, did the ideas of calculus go from India to Europe and so on? And I mean, I'm not interested in who found and whether Newton and Leibniz knew about it. It's not an interesting question for me. But what is interesting is the way they did their calculus so differently. Mm -hmm. So just like you know, you pointed out the very yeah. different styles in that sense to invoke yeah. the idea of style. Mm -hmm. The way the India Kerala mathematicians did calculus is so different. Mm -hmm. But they give the most famous Euler formula for the expansion of pi. And you can actually read it. It's a prose text. It's a long uh, inter, you know, infinite series which is truncated. There are error terms after nth term and so on. It's, you know, it's very difficult not to see the ideas of calculus in it. Mm -hmm. But they, don't, they are not even engaging with it at that level. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, there's some very interesting connections which might, uh, you know, which I found when you were talking about. No, I fully agree. And in fact, the, so the first time I heard about the idea of meta coin was in a working group that we had with people coming from different uh, different type of philosophy of science and, and, uh, and especially with Evelyn Fox Keller works on biology and she 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 both she um, read this article and said that's it's an interesting article we were interested in all the notion of culture you know all the kind of epistemological culture epistemic culture schools tradition how to, how to characterize that and she read that and says it's interesting this idea of science and the first example of, so she we read the we read the article all together we went, we, we convey, and, and Evelyn, she said, I, I, I don't know what to do with that. I don't even understand what a style in this sense is. And one of my colleagues was working on Chinese mathematics, not Indian mathematics, but Chinese mathematics, said, I will show it to you. And she made a computation with words in front of us. And the way that um, division are seen as uh, inverse of multiplication is a completely different setting just because of the manipulation of words in some kind of Chinese uh, computation. And, and it was illuminating for me, because you, you saw the, the, exactly what you said, that is to say that this is the construction itself that, that, that uh, carried the inferences, and what, is, what, what they are doing, and not the concept that we project on them. And we have a lot of trouble to understand exactly what's happening, because we project our own concept on all of this practice. And the most interesting thing I think, and the most uh, promising thing is that it reopens completely our way to see the so-called Western culture. Because these authors like Munders or Evin Nets, in fact, they will totally agree with what you say. But what you, that, that is to say, they will say, Plato uh, prevent us to see the mathematical practice of the Greeks. Because in the Greeks, there is no foundational debates in the mathematician. And this is strange. All the foundational debates are in the philosophers. Are in the philosophers. But there is no foundational debate in Euclid, in Archimedes, and so on. In Apollonius, no foundational debate at all. The manipulation of irrationality in Book 10 of Euclid, no problem. It's a manipulation. It's a strange manipulation. But it's a manipulation. It's, it's a computation. And so, and, and Bruno Latour wrote a beautiful article, you can find it online, on Rivenet's book, which is, uh, I, I don't remember the, the full title of it, but he, he, one, one section is called Plato in Hollywood. Plato in Hollywood. And, and, and this is the idea that we, we, we see this, uh, this history of mathematics as a big movie with this picture, with these authors. So this is the cave, Plato's cave. And this concept, these ideas, and so on, and, and, and in a way, we are now completely changing this view, completely changing. And, and this is very interesting because it puts all the mathematical, all the mathematical practice on the same footing. We start by that, and then we see what, how they work and what they can do. And for example, I have, I have a colleague working on the 
mathematics in the, in the top alignment in, with the string figures. Very interesting, all the topology that you can do with the string figures. And this is a culture that you find everywhere in the world. And uh, very complex, and uh, it's very intriguing. But the conceptualization is changing from one culture to the other. The meaning is changing, but the figure, the transformation are the same. You can find, and it's a kind of computation. And this is, these are very fruitful, very, very, very interesting. And to look at all modern science in this way, I think is a very important thing to do now, and to, to get rid of a, a lot of mythologies about the, the way that we do. That does not mean that concepts are not useful. <laughs> I want to make that clear. Concepts can be useful. Sometimes there are very important things which are linked to the delimitation of theories, concepts, and notions. But the point is to say, not all the time. Not all the time. But I fully, I fully agree. And I think this is precisely uh, where we can have a lot of interdisciplinary, intercultural studies going on. Because also, this notion of style is interesting for anthropologists, for people working in semiotic, semiotic and literature, and so on. There are all kinds of things which are linked. The very general question, uh, often when we go against, the, you say this is not representation, then you, then you, I often find people then end up saying, well, it's not representation, but it's a toolbox, and you keep returning to this metaphor of the toolbox as the kind of final side to, uh, we've got the toolbox, so this is just a toolbox, and this is, I guess, an anti-metaphysical gesture or something. And after a point, I'm not, you know, I can make it more precise. I can make yeah. it more precise. Yeah. I fully agree with you. In fact, what I described, you can call it a kind of a presentation. You can call it a, for example, in Leibniz, that I know very well, this will be called a kind of a presentation, typically, or expression. You use both words. No, but what, what, what I want to say is that, the mo let's say that you have different models of representation, a different model of sign, or, or, or What I want to, uh, to get rid of is the idea that what we are doing is that we have some kind of elements, whatever they are, and we map them in signs, whatever they are. Okay, this is what I want to get rid of. What I want to emphasize is the fact that what is interesting is the relation, and what we map are the relation. Okay. Whatever they are, what, whatever the value is. Okay? So this is what uh, Peirce called a diagram. It's a kind of iconic representation. It's a very specific case because what we represent, what we represent are relation. Okay. And I want to be more specific because what I want to represent are some kind of inferences. Okay. So that's another kind of relation, but not, not only, uh, not, not, you, can, you can have a relation that are not uh, inferences. So I fully agree, I fully agree with, uh, with in fact, this is the vocabulary of Hutchins. Hutchins wants to get rid of representation because he wants to find against some ethnological studies of these people in which people try to recreate a representation behind this way of navigating and he found that completely useless. And I think he was right. And so he says, get, get rid of the representation, just keep the dynamic behind. But, uh, but uh, I fully agree that uh, I have no problem with the representation. Uh, not at all. It's a tricky word. It's a tricky word. And, and I agree that uh, all, all the toolbox and pragmatics or whatever is very in fashion. In fashion and, and can be dangerous. All the pragmatics and so on. But in Putnam, in all of these authors, this is more than a fashion. It's really, I mean, we look at things, we try to. And what we try to do, uh, really, I did not want to, to show it to you in detail, but what, what we all work is not all of this. Uh, Vague gesture that I made in front of you. Our work is to identify the influences. This is what is interesting. Because I think that, for, I think that, for example, if we are right, we identify the specific kind of influences that are new in Descartes and Fermat. And if I'm right, this is important because that will solve many, many difficulties. I, I, I work with people working on Arabic mathematics. In, in my team, people are working on all, all the places in the world, all the kind of science. My colleague in, in Arabic mathematics, they tell me, you can't say that Descartes invented algebraic geometry. This is simply false. And they show me the text, and I'm obliged to say, you're right. You're right. To, to construct an equation with diagram and so on, this is already in Ariane. 
it's clear. I mean, it's, it's not the same, it's not symbolic, it's with pose, but he is doing exactly what Descartes is doing. So what Descartes is doing more, what is different? If, if you succeed to identify this, so we have something very strong, very strong. Representation is too weak to, to capture this. So that's why I want to emphasize inferences. We, we, we need to, some ways of reasoning, some chains of inferences we are very specific. In this case, the, the, the inferences, which is very important, is the so-called method of indeterminate coefficient. So I won't explain to you, but this is the core. This is the core of the yeah, just to add a point, I mean, the question of representation is a very misleading one. You know, once we phrase it as a representation, because of all its results, we tag it. But in terms of what you are saying, what you said, uh, you know, I think that's far more important because in my earlier argument, one of the arguments I've been saying is that symbols are also representations. Absolutely. In the sense, they encode information. Absolutely. So the way, and that's very special to mathematical writing, that the symbolic writing is actually, as you, you know, one one complex form of writing, you know, what one could call a grapheme, or symbolic, you know, a mathematical yeah. term, actually is a long story in itself, and yeah. it, it in, includes a very complex way of writing that, and yeah. and that's in fact that also raises this uh, this bogey of causality, which is again very popular in philosophy of mathematics. You know, after this Benazir's problem of existence of entities, it's such a pseudo problem because no, writing agree. breaks the causality. I mean. The way you engage with mathematical terms is through this written materiality. Absolutely. And these materialities are real. But now, uh, there are some tricky aspects to that. And for example, in my corpus, I have, I have some problems with, with, uh, that I, I, I give them to you, and then you think about it. My authors, they are not stable in terms of symbolic writing. Okay, this is very important. Ferma does not use the same kind of symbolic writing than Descartes. So they can't use the kind of symbolic writing that you learn in school. He is inventor of this. You know this kind of thing. Something like that. Okay? You all know this. So Descartes is the inventor of this way to write. Um, Fermat does not use this. He used the Vietas notation, which is very heavy, very difficult to, to use. That is to say that you will put uh, a voyeur for the unknowns, and, but here you will, you will write this. You will write a uh, uh, quadro quadratu with an abbreviation. Okay? So, um, and, and this will continue in the 17th century. For example, Sluz used all the. Uh, uh, so, this is a tricky question, the question of symbolic writing. Very, very tricky question. And, uh, and, uh, and in, in our case, it was not stable. So that, that is to say that you can carry, oftentimes people consider that, uh, for example, I have a colleague who wrote a book explaining that this kind of writing was a revolution and that before you could not do all kind of things that you can do only with this writing. But since he wrote this book, we found evidence of people doing with the old writing amazing things, especially in, in what is called cosis notation, in which you have a symbol for every power of the unknown, very heavy, very difficult to consider relation. In fact, Descartes worked for a while with cosis notation, and it was discovered not too long ago. So uh, there, there, are tricky, there are tricky things about the question of, sy of symbolic writing and what they encode exactly, what we can do with them or not. It's very, very difficult, very difficult to answer this question. So I'm, let's say I'm cautious with, uh, with this aspect. <clears throat> you said how uh, in different cultural conceptual worlds people were writing differently, but the kind of uh, conclusion results were similar in some ways. So uh, what I was wondering is, uh, mathematics itself is, a, like if you want to call it a language in, in some ways, so there are these multiple narratives that are created in mathematics from symbolic language. So if we, in, if you look at other cultures and you get, for example, Aryabhatta who wrote in a book like a poetic form or a prose form, and then if there is an interaction between that kind of uh, mathematical language and a symbolic mathematical language that developed in the Western culture, how as an, does that interaction lead, can lead to something more uh, like even uh, 
more narratives uh, which can be which can uh, help in the development of mathematics in different way and then how does that uh, can affect uh, because mathematics itself is uh, like symbolic writing is used in science so how does that uh, may have an effect in uh, scientific writing so this is this is an open uh, this is an open question because for a long time what was considered is that the fact to turn to symbol was always a good thing in a way there was some kind of uh, mythology about that because it shortens the demonstration, it makes them easier, it makes some relation visible and so on. But when you look very precisely from an historical point of view, you will see at different stage of history people fighting against symbolic writing. And the question is, are they always, always born? And no. <laughs> and a good example, so uh, for, the, for the mathematics that I know the best, the mathematics of the 17th century, uh, a lot of people were against symbolic writing. Pascal was against. Robert Wall were against Descartes, Newton. The first Newton was for symbolic writing, but the second Newton said, no, no, I made a mistake. I, I, it was not a good idea. You know that if you read the Critica, uh, that there is no symbolic uh, writing in the sense of uh, differential calculus. He got rid of this. For, for and there are deep reasons behind this. Because symbolic writing introduced errors of its own, it introduced misleading views. I give you one example. A lot of people they say that Leibniz is the great supporter of symbolic writing, characteristical universalist, and so forth and so on. When you read Leibniz, for example, when it comes to imaginary numbers, okay, and you would you would say he was very happy with imaginary numbers, but no, we soon that you consider them as being fiction. I gave a quote. Why? He gave he, he gave the example. He says, if I give you a problem, I put it in algebraic terms. And I said, for example, that I have, I have, a, I have, this is an example given by Leibniz. I have a circle, you have a tangent, you draw a line, okay? I know, I know the, 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 the radius, it's a radius, yes, and I know, I have a few elements. Give me, give me this value, okay? So you have the equation, okay? In fact, you will have a problem because depending on the position of this, you can have no intersection. These are the imaginary roots of your equation. So Leibniz will not conclude like a modern one, a modern person, that these are intersection in the projective plane. Okay? He will never say that. He said it shows you that you made a mistake because in coaching your problem in symbolic form, you forgot some condition that makes it possible to have two real two real two real roots. Okay? So this, this question of the role of symbol of symbolic writing is, is very interesting to look in, in, in the fine grained literature. And the fact that there are many things that we can't do because we don't use symbolic writing, because we write with prose or I don't know what, is very contested today. There are many, many things that you can do without symbolic writing in mathematics. With many things. And, 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 and also because you can use diagrams, you can use all kinds of tricks, which are not symbolic writings in this sense. And, and, and for example, category theory, all these kind of things that are not very widely uh, widespread, is it a symbolic writing in the same sense that it was for? Uh, this is not clear. I mean, there, there are some proofs that you do really by looking at this is called diagram chasing. You look in the diagram and you want some, uh, some, uh, some uh, diagram to commute, and you complete the diagram. This is diagrammatic reasoning, we call it this. So we are really trying to change this view on this clear cut opposition between symbolic, which is, let's say, modern, progress, shortened the reasoning, and not symbolic, which is old fashioned, heavy, and so on. This is no, not, so, not so clear. And by the way, if you look at the people who, to, who have tried to do purely symbolic math, this is a nightmare. Nobody can read this. You know, like Principia Mathematica, Russell and Montaigne, it, it, it's, it's a nightmare. So mathematics is not purely symbolic. Symbols plus many other things. And, and now I think we are much and more interesting in the way that you have different resources and you couple them. You couple them. The way to enrich things is to couple different kinds of inferential system and resources. Okay, yeah. um, I'm more interested in the cognitive aspect which you mentioned at the end. Uh, you mentioned that, like, say, for example, if there are different ways of representing and different ways of doing a problem, different ways of approaching uh, a question altogether, uh, then 
is there a way we can say that, I mean, there would be no way or there is no question that we can say one way of representation is better than the other because each representational way of solving a problem or approaching the problem would leave would lead us to a different direction altogether, which is not given by the viewpoint altogether. If that is the case, uh, is there a question that we can take this representational system is heavier than the other way and also? And uh, what follows from this is that uh, uh, the logical positivism is in a way uh, is closer to uh, explaining all these things because it, it means that there are certain concepts which are independent of the representational system, which are basic or foundation, out of which all representation takes from that and represent them in a different way of thinking. So can we take that down? Yeah. No, I understand what you said. The point is the discrepancy between the view of the philosopher, of the cognitive scientist, and the view of the mathematician, in this case. I think that no mathematician would ever say what you said, that is to say that you can go whatever way, we don't know if it's fruitful or not. This is not the way it works. In the real history of mathematics, the community of mathematicians have a strong feeling of what is fruitful and what is not, what solve problems and what is, what, what is not. Sometimes they, 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 they are wrong. Sometimes they are wrong and we rediscover things that they thought were not fruitful and so on. But it's impossible to look at this and say all the, um, all the, all the trajectories are equivalent. You see what I mean? Because these are completely different uh, perspectives. You have one perspective which is inside of the mathematical practice in which you have some problems to solve. You have hard problems, you have dead problems, you have uh, future problems and so on. So you have a certain classification of problems. In this sense, not all trajectories are equivalent. They come, okay? And then you have the view of the cognitivist uh, scientists or the people who reconstruct that and says, seen from another point of view, for other problems, from other uh, things, they can be seen as being equivalent. And if you mix these two things, you lose <laughs> the history of mathematics, the practice. So what we want is precisely, for example, what I want is precisely to explain why Descartes was really fruitful compared to the old-fashioned geometry. Even if later, in the 19th century, we realized that synthetic geometry was not so bad that they thought. So we want really to explain, so we, we want to, to, um, to be attached to the mathematical practice and not, not reconstruct everything on the same footing so that everything is equivalent. And that's why we don't want uh, concept, <laughs> the kind of conceptual construction. That's precisely why. Because from a conceptual point of view, you have Desart on one side, you have Descartes on the other side, and you say, des, des armes, this is the beginning of projective geometry. This is amazing. Point to infinity, projection, unification of conic section. This is as powerful as they can. This is true. But there is no projective geometry in 17th century. And there will be no projective geometry until the 19th century. And in fact, you need algebraic geometry to do the modern. Uh, if you get rid of this, they, they design and they can, same thing. I mean, as powerful as good. But this is not a good story. This is not the way that things develop. You, you had first a very fruitful things that developed, and the others was not was conceptually incredible, but they didn't have the tool to do it. They didn't have the material setting, they didn't have the writing, they didn't have the, 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 the way to solve problems that were fruitful for the authors of art at the time. And that I want to explain. That I want to explain, not their concepts. Because the, the explanation of concept was done was done already by all the traditional history of mathematics. We have this reconstruction by modern means of all the episodes of uh, history of mathematics. But now we want to go a step further. You know, to go to the... On behalf of uh, MCPS, I would extend a heartfelt thanks to uh, David Ratner for giving us this fantastic talk. I'm sure everyone has taken away something from it. It was much of a pretty and very relevant to some of the students who are also looking at science study even more recently. Science study. And hopefully, we'll bring up enough interest in philosophy and mathematics for a few more. Thank you so much.